and welcome to the Extremist Publishing Podcast. I'm Tom Christie. It's a great pleasure to be joined today by a brand new friend of the podcast and someone that I've known for around 20 years. His name is Ken Thompson and he's had one of the most fascinating careers that you can imagine. He's worked in transport history, cultural heritage and also um, widely in the hospitality sector where he's worked for some of the biggest names in the in the world, in fact, including the Hilton chain and also the Radisson chain. Ken has also been the past president of the Chartered Institute for Logistics and Transport, so it's a great pleasure to welcome him today. Thanks very much, Tom, and good to be able to join you and have this chat about Stirling and about its heritage and about its background and its significance in, in today's world. Well, you've had a, a long career in Stirling, Ken, because of course you, you work with the famous and much applauded management school at Stirling University, but you also have a long association with the Stirling District Tourism Organisation. That's right, yes, Stirling has been my home for, gosh, the best part of 30 years now, and yes, I've lived longer in Stirling than I have anywhere else, so it's well and truly home for me. And yes, I have been associated with Stirling District Tourism going back to 2004. Uh, so yes, 20 years this year, Tom, and that's that's amazing to think. I, I joined the organisation initially on a part-time basis for a short uh, one-year contract just to help them with communications, looking after marketing for the organisation and for the four heritage properties which at that stage they were responsible for, two here in the city itself and two outside the Stirling, Stirling city. Because it is an amazing organisation and it does so much to put the spotlight on Stirling, what makes it such an interesting place to live, but also all of those tales of Stirling's cultural heritage over the centuries. Stirling's very lucky because it is really, really very, very rich in terms of all of its assets, all of its attributes. But it's not just the physical assets, as you know. It's not just those buildings. It's not just those monuments. It's not just those locations and places. It's the stories that lie behind them. And it's everything that led to Stirling being recognised, as indeed it was for many, many years, described as the brooch that was the clasp, effectively, at the centre of Scotland, it used to be said years ago that whoever controlled Stirling controlled Scotland because it was not just the centre of this region, but it was the centre of the whole country. And yes, whether armies were trying to move men or whether farmers were trying to move cattle or whether merchants were trying to move produce, in the days when there was no crossing of the Forth to the east of Stirling, everything came through the city, everything came through Stirling. And that has given it a unique place in Scottish history and a unique place in the heritage landscape as well. It certainly has. Um, Stirling District Tourism has been working tirelessly to promote that history and the cultural heritage of Stirling more widely. Its latest venture, I understand, has been the custodianship of the historic Church of the Holyrood. What can you tell us about that amazing site? Yes, whenever Stirling District Tourism was first established back in 1995, it took on responsibility at that stage for four historic properties, four heritage properties, which were operated as visitor attractions and which all at that stage were controlled by the local authority at the time, which was Stirling District Council. And those four properties included the former St Kessig's Church in Callender, which was the Rob Roy and the Trossachs Visitor Centre, the former mill in Callin, which was the Bredalbin Folklore Centre, the Old Town Jail in Stirling, and the well-known and indeed <laughs> world-famous uh, National Wallace Monument. The charity's lease on the monument ended in 2020 uh, during the year or certain during the time when we had the lockdowns and everything else associated with COVID-19 and we were in the middle of the pandemic at that stage and having come to the end of that particular contract and that particular responsibility for managing and operating that attraction the charity was very keen to enter into partnership or into collaboration with another body here in the city and that was central to what SDT set out to do right from the very start back in the 1990s, working in partnership, working in collaboration, sharing its expertise, but also learning from the experience of others 
so that together we could turn that spotlight on Stirling, focus on the city and share its history and share its many stories, not just with the people in the city itself, not just with people in this region, but also with people who come to visit Stirling from so many parts of the world. I think it's important to mention um, to people who perhaps haven't been to Stirling, and I would encourage you to come and visit for yourselves. Absolutely. <laughs> There's so much to see here. If you go to the top of the town, um, people will immediately recognise Stirling Castle, which has European significance for its architecture and also for its preservation. But there are so many other places to see. There's Cowan's Hospital. There is Mars Walk. There is the Old Town Jail. Uh, so many other sites to, to see. And certainly amongst the pinnacle of those uh, historical sites is the Holyrood. Um, such an amazing place and uh, a place where a coronation has taken place, but also a royal baptism. And uh, it's definitely somewhere that you wouldn't want to miss if you happen to be in the area. Yes, very, very often uh, the Church of the Holy Rood is referred to as the second oldest or the second most important building in Stirling after the castle. But yes, it has that history because it does have its origins back in the 12th century, whenever the first church was established on that site. And indeed, it's very appropriate that we think about that heritage and that length of time over which there has been a place of worship, a place where people came to meet in prayer uh, at that particular location. In the 1400s, there was a major fire which took place in Stirling and the original church was destroyed at that stage. But even though we, in, that was then the 15th century, work started fairly promptly on the construction of a new church. And right from the outset, that church had the support of royalty because it was used by the royal families. It was used by those people at the castle for whom it became a place of worship. And of course, when we think back to the Stuart monarchy and we think back to the, 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 those people who were in residence at the castle at the time, Stirling was very often their favourite royal location, the favourite palace, the favourite place to be. And obviously the church was just alongside the castle, just adjacent there. So yes, even at one stage, although it's no longer there, uh, the church had its own royal balcony, its own royal gallery, where literally, as you said, Tom, kings and queens worshipped. Yes. Yeah, it's an astonishing place, it really is. And uh, as I say, if you're in the area, you really won't want to miss it. It has one of the most amazing um, cemeteries actually. I think there are five separate cemeteries under one banner including Commonwealth War Games but also some of the most uh, astonishing characters from Stirling's history um, can be found there so I would certainly recommend uh, anyone should come for a visit. Yes, when it, there are amazing stories associated with the churchyard or the kirkyard which lies immediately to to the north of the church itself and is well worth a visit and indeed uh, it helps to explain so much of the history of Stirling as well when you when you come across some of those stories and when you encounter them. Um, I met a visitor to, to Scotland recently who told me that they had started their holiday in Scotland in Stirling and they said that planning that and making that decision to start their holiday in Stirling was the best thing they ever did because everywhere else they went during their tour of Scotland whether it was a, his, a stately home or another historical venue or anywhere else, the stories that they learned there and what they discovered there about Scotland, it all made sense because they had started their visit in Stirling. And indeed, Stirling tells that story of the country's history mm -hmm. so well and so effectively. It certainly does. I mean, let's not forget in that uh, cemetery there is the Star Pyramid which famously is one of the largest monumental pyramids in Scotland. Um, and that is uh, in memoriam of the Drummond family, um, who are kind of our heroes, actually, because they really put Stilling on the map when it came to book publishing. Um, at one point, they were exporting so many books, in fact, that they had to put an extra track in at Stilling Railway Station. So I'm all for Gosh. doing it again. <laughs> <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't aware that an extra track had been laid at the railway station specifically for that purpose. But yes, um, that's fascinating to think that that happened, yes. Um, the, the Victorian period, when the railways arrived in Stirling, I think it was 1848 that the first train came into Stirling Station. 
And interestingly, the railways arrived in Stirling despite local opposition. There were even protest marches taking place in Stirling. Uh, ministers of the church condemned the railways from the pulpit, saying that these dreadful contraptions were the work of the devil and would only encourage the lower orders to wander aimlessly about the countryside. Uh, even the farmers took to the streets in Stirling to protest, saying that the racket and the commotion caused by the railways would likely stop the hens from laying and drive the cattle insane. <laughs> but the, yes, the railways arrived in Stirling. And that was another thing that really put the city on the map because that was the Victorian period. Uh, Victoria had been on the throne since 1837. And her enthusiasm for Scotland and her enthusiasm for visiting this region and for visiting this part of Scotland, she famously came to the Trossachs and opened the waterway that connects Loch Catron with Glasgow and provides the power supply to the city. But her enthusiasm and her, her admiration for this part of the world really prompted so many people to want to come and discover Stirling for themselves. And of course, the arrival of the railways in the mid-1840s made that possible for everybody to reach the city and to come to the city and see for themselves the castle that they had read about and see for themselves the other incredible buildings in the city, including the Church of the Holy Rood. Yes, and, and let's not forget good old Sir Walter Scott, whose Lady of the Lake enticed so many people to come to the Trossachs. That's true. Yeah. So, something else that the railways made possible. Yeah, absolutely. And, that, and, and his writings in the Lady of the Lake, the name lives on to this day in one of the boats that operates the cruises on Loch Catherine. So it's a wonderful way in which you can enjoy a holiday in this part of the world because you not only have the heritage of the city and all of the attributes of the city but on your doorstep and within an hour's drive you can be in some of the most beautiful countryside in in scotland yeah and if you haven't been on one of those steamships on the uh, loch catron i would very much recommend that you do because you will see some of the most amazing scenery um, now, the last time I was there was when we were researching the Heart 200 book, and uh, I can honestly say at that point it was pelting rain, it couldn't have been heavier, and it still looks stunning. It still it's an amazing Absolutely. place. Absolutely, it has an atmosphere which is quite unique. And of course, uh, the landscape has got so many stories as well, including the stories of the famous Rob Roy, Rob Roy McGregor, uh, <laughs> whose, whose exploits were, were notorious and his will be forever associated with that particular part of the country. Yes, we're really spoiled for literary connections, actually, because you have the Wordsworths coming to Strathire. Mm -hmm. You have um, Robert Louis Stevenson passing through Loch Ernhead. Um, there are so many connections here. You know, I think there's it's, it's something that could be celebrated, really. Absolutely, yeah. There's a, there's a literary history there. And, of course, not just from those writers from the past, but, of course, today we have the focus on crime fiction, which has been the inspiration for the Bloody Scotland Festival, mm -hmm. which takes place towards the end of the summer each year, and which again brings authors and writers and crime writing enthusiasts <laughs> to Stirling uh, to attend workshops and readings and everything else that takes place during that event. Yeah, no, it's terrific that that literary connection has continued. But I have to ask, Ken, I don't know how much you can give away, but what kind of events do you have coming up at Stirling District Tourism over the year ahead? How can local people and visitors to Stirling get involved? One of the things which we try to do as an organisation is present a programme of events that supports our charitable objects in terms of telling the story of Stirling and telling the stories of this wonderful landscape, uh, but also enables people to pursue their particular interests and understand better uh, and learn more about about the city we run events through our center at the abbey craig which is known as legends legends at the monument we have our coffee house there which serves teas coffee snacks sandwiches throughout the day and then on a number of occasions throughout the year we have evening events, we have talks, we have presentations, we have guest speakers, we have folk joining us and addressing a wide range of subjects, many of which are of interest to people locally, but also to people who want to find out more about the city and about its surroundings. So this month we have a number of different events, including a foraging event, which is a guided walk telling in which people are able to understand more about the flora and fauna of the region. And we also have, for example, an evening presentation being hosted by the RSPB, 
looking at bird life on the Abbey Craig. But we don't just have that natural history element. We also have the story of Stirling and its architecture, its landscape, its geology, all of those different themes which are explored through the events that take place at Legends. And we're always delighted to welcome people along to those talks and to those presentations. We are also introducing a program of activities this year at the Church of the Holy Rood as well. So we will be announcing details of some of those events coming up during the summer as well. And that'll include musical events, it'll include talks. And of course, later on in the year, we're going to have a half day heritage workshop as we held in November last year, uh, accompanied with guided walks so that people are able to be escorted through the churchyard and in and around the church and see some of the uh, points of interest in, in that area. Because we see, obviously, from social media that you have this really exciting programme of events coming up later in the year, Stilling 900, which marks a really significant date for the city. What can we look forward to as part of that commemoration? Well, yes, Stirling 900 is a wider initiative involving events right across the whole city. And we're talking about everything here from outdoor concerts, which will be taking place in the shadow of the castle during the summer. I think we've got people like Tom Jones and... Who else, who else is coming on? Others lined up to come to those events? Shania Twain. Absolutely, yeah. Twain. So American country music enthusiasts, get your tickets now to come to that event. So yes, but it's it's not just those events. It's some of the legacy events, Tom, we could call to refer to as well. Uh, in August this year, we'll have the, the Sterling Highland Games, which having obviously not been able to take place during the pandemic has now come back better and brighter and bigger than ever and a whole host of things to be seen and to be enjoyed on that particular day but yes there are events taking place throughout Stirling in 2024 all of which will be part of the Stirling 900 program and that marks or that commemorates the awarding of the status of the Royal Borough to Stirling by King David I David I of Scotland uh, in 1124. Um, he succeeded his brother, Alexander I, and with the support of Henry I at that stage, who was the King of England, he became, he took the crown of Scotland. And he had a remark remarkable impact on the landscape of Scotland because he established a number of boroughs during his reign with his credentials and with his approval, including Perth and including Stirling. I think Berwick and Pontweed was one of them. I think Linlithgow was one of them. But yes, uh, his particular uh, reign during the, during the 1100s, from 1124 onwards, was a period of huge transformation in Scotland. Yes, I mean, such a fascinating character, and I think we remember him for things like Camus Kenneth Abbey and things like that, don't we? He was responsible for the establishment of a number of abbeys and monasteries in Scotland that he supported and that he wanted to see constructed. Um, I think some of the best known abbeys uh, and in, in the borders, we have King David to thank for those, for him those at Selkirk and Melrose so yes he definitely left his mark on the landscape there's there's no question about that I didn't realize also that not only was he the king of Scotland but he also was recognized as a saint Saint David and his saint's day is the 24th of May each year so there's other reasons why he became such an important or significant figure in, in, in history. So it's King David we have to thank for Stilling 900. And I hope that you will check out social media and see some of the amazing events that are coming up later in the year because you're in for a treat. Yes, a good place to find information on all of those events is the Your Sterling website, yoursterling.com. And they have a special page that provides some information and some interesting background stories linked to the significance of the Sterling 900 uh, anniversary, uh, but also there's a great calendar there and it's very easy to find out information there about more of those events and obviously links to the ticket options to purchase uh, for those events. So Ken, what do you think the future holds for Stirling and for SDT? 
how do you think the culture and heritage of the area is going to unfold and continue to be celebrated over the next 900 years? It's, it's interesting because if you think about how much Stirling has changed, gosh, I've lived here since the mid-1990s, uh, and I can see a lot of change in the city since that time. Uh, and anybody who has been in Stirling for longer will have seen a, a huge amount of change taking place in the city over that time. And yes, it, isn't it fascinating when you get the chance to look, and we see lots of them on social media these days, of the, the Stirling past and present type photographs, the old Stirling images. And you look at them and you see the railway station, and then you realise how much the landscape has changed all around Stirling. And I think it's true to say that Stirling will continue to change. The economy of Stirling will change. When you think back even even 50 years ago, to what the main industries at that stage were in Stirling. Uh, companies like John Player, based in Stirling, with cigarette production, other large manufacturing organisations, which are no longer present in the city. But you see the way in which new industries, new businesses, new fields of activity have come along and replaced those. Uh, the emphasis on, on, dig on the digital economy, some of the companies that we now see who are pioneering some of the innovations that we, we, we see in medical science and research, some of the companies that are close to us here in the in the innovation park at the university. And so there's a huge change in the in the, in the economy of Stirling which drives the city and which also makes it a place that people want to come and live in and people want to come and work in and that companies want to invest in as well. But no matter how much that aspect of the city changes it will still have its place in history and the heritage dimension will still be incredibly important. Those things that have made Stirling the place it is, that have made it of such significance, that have put it on the map worldwide, and those are the things that people want to protect, those are the things that people want, people value, and those are the things that we will want to make sure that we are able to pass them on to future generations so that in years to come people will still be coming to Stirling because the the experience of visiting Stirling Castle is so memorable. The opportunity to visit incredible buildings such as the Church of the Holy Rood to walk in and see probably the finest medieval oak timbered structure still standing in Scotland and to be able to worship in that environment, to be able to have a moment of quiet reflection, to be able to find a place for prayer and for inspiration and for guidance. And that basic human need to give meaning and purpose to human life and to find it through the church or to find it through a place such as that, we'll still have that in years to come. That'll still be as important to people in the future as it is today. And that's why Sterling will still be able to attract people and will still be able to deliver a fulfilling experience for those who come here. Yes, I think that's where we're really blessed in Stirling actually. There's so much uh, pictographic evidence, not just from the you know, Victorian era you mentioned, but even going back to the 80s, the Doomsday Project with the laser discs and things like that. You can mm -hmm. get a glimpse into what life in Stirling was like in the 80s and how much has changed and yet how much has stayed the same. It's a really interesting eye on the, the, the town and the, the way that it's developed. Absolutely, yeah. And of course, Stirling has that great advantage of being located within easy access of the two lar largest cities in Scotland, within easy access of, of, of both Edinburgh and Glasgow. But yet it's got its own distinctive character and its own unique status. Uh, and that makes it such an attractive place to live and work. Well, Ken, thanks so much for having joined us today for what has been a really fascinating and wide-ranging <laughs> chat that's brought in the past, the present and the future of Stirling. Uh, it's been great to talk to you. We've touched on a lot of things, but yes, it's been really interesting, Tom. Thank you very much indeed. So I hope that you'll check out Stirling District Tourism on the internet and you can have a look at the Legends at the Monument uh, coffee Absolutely. house and shop. But you can also have a look at the Holyrood and find out all of the many different events that are going on there. And I hope that you will make it right at the top of your list of destinations the next time that you're in Stirling. So thanks once again, Ken, for all of your time today. It's been fantastic to catch up with you. And thank you, everyone at home, for having listened. I do hope that you'll tune in again soon. Thank you.
If you would like to find out more about advertising on the Extremist Publishing Podcast, please visit their website at www.extremistpublishing.com for details.